Thank you very much for that introduction. It's great to be here talking about intellectual property and 3D printing. It seems a very appropriate week to be doing so. We have been celebrating Open Access Week in Australia very vigorously, and many of the issues that we've been considering uh, raise issues in relation to open access. Uh, it has also been a very dramatic week in terms of copyright law in Australia. The coalition government and the Australian Labor Party are rushing through new site blocking search filtering laws to place even greater regulation upon intermediaries <laughs> in Australia. Uh, in that context, it seems very appropriate to be kind of considering how the intellectual property regime uh, might grapple with some of these concerns, particularly in relation to some of the new disruptive uh, technologies. Uh, so my presentation in particular is going to kind of provide a case study and look at a very particular conflict that has broken out um, over metal 3D printing, really looking at issues about patent law and trade secrets. But I also at the outset want to kind of give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of some of the larger issues and conflicts taking place in the larger patent landscape around 3D printing. Uh, but I've been working on 3D printing for a little while now, um, kind of predating the ARC research project. And now it's great to be working with Dr. Carly Papalado doing some empirical research on what is happening in relation to intellectual property and 3D printing. Um, we have a edited collection uh, coming out in the new year called 3D Printing and Beyond, Intellectual Property and Regulation, uh, co-edited by Janusha Mendez from Bournemouth University, Mark Lemley from Stanford Law School, and myself. Uh, and really that has a comparative range of perspectives on some of the debates on intellectual property and 3D printing, particularly looking at the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia, and uh, building upon the magnificent book by uh, Professor Marcus Norgard on, and his colleagues on intellectual property and 3D printing. That kind of particular book really raises larger questions about whether 3D printing is going to be very disruptive for intellectual property law, practice and policy. So Professor Mark Lemley, uh, in his work, IP in a world without scarcity, says that intellectual property will be very existentially threatening to intellectual property because it will create this abundance. And that will be very challenging in terms of how the regime will work. Whereas doubters like Gertrude Van uh, 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 overall has kind of argued that Intellectual property has a long history of accommodating new disruptive technologies, many of which that Mark has pointed out in his slides. It will be able to accommodate 3D printing much like it accommodated photocopiers and uh, digitization and various other technologies. So my case study is in that context of that larger debate that is going on. Uh, Helpfully, my colleague kind of set up very nicely some of the debates going on in relation to patents and 3D printing. But it's worthwhile noting that some of the earliest patents from the late 70s, early 1980s by Charles Hull and others have now expired and entered the public domain. Perhaps one of the reasons why there's been uh, a big 3D printing revolution is that some of the foundational technologies are now widely available. Uh, studies by the World Intellectual Property Organisation have certainly highlighted uh, the amazing range and diversity of patent applications in the field of 3D printing. Uh, so their study a few years ago looking at breakthrough technologies looked at 3D printing, robotics and nanotechnology. Uh, the study, amongst other things, uh, looked at what companies were dominating the landscape. And it was a strange mixture of some specialist 3D printing companies like 3D Systems and Stratasys. But then you had some conglomerates like General Electric and Siemens coming in and filing their own patent applications. Uh, but you also had quite a bit in the way of IT companies, but also kind of uh, companies interested in building cars um, were busy filing uh, patent applications. It's also been very noticeable how uh, certain clusters of public research organisations and universities have been very busy in this area. MIT, uh, famously, uh, Dr. Papalado visited the many maker labs at uh, MIT. But more recently, in many different areas, we've seen the rise of China in terms of filing IP applications. And that certainly comes out through the uh, statistics there. 
So certain key countries are really um, dominating the stats. It comes out a bit more clearer in this diagram. As you can see, the IP superpower rivalry between the US, Germany, Japan, the UK and the Republic of Korea. And increasingly, China is rising in terms of the level of, of its patent applications, although there is some debate about the quality of those applications. Uh, in relation to uh, the sorts of patent filings, you can also see that there's been a real shift um, towards commercial filings in relation to patent applications. So while the academic and public sector um, perhaps have had a very significant role early on, uh, as time has gone by, really 3D printing has been dominated by commercial players in terms of patent applications. Um, and in terms of our own empirical research, we've kind of worked with an entity called IFI Claims Patent Services to do an up-to-date mapping quantitatively of 3D printing patents. And we have found over 20,000 patent families relating to 3D printing, um, which is a, a huge amount of patents in terms of the area. So I guess my takeaway point from this empirical research is that it's becoming a very crowded landscape um, with all that activity at the moment. And we would expect more conflicts between the players, more patent infringement actions, and actions to challenge the validity of patents as a result. Uh, so quite an amazing universe of cross-cutting hybrid technology in relation to 3D uh, printing patents. And in terms of the larger portfolio universe, including cited patents and citing um, patents, there's nearly about half a million different kind of patents and documents relating to 3D printing that are within that universe. So we're kind of creating this really interesting picture of what is happening in relation to this technology field. Our stats in some way replicate what we found um, from the World Intellectual Property Study. So Hewlett Packard is making a very significant push in terms of its patent filings. General Electric, another kind of generalist player, is pushing in. Stratasys and 3D systems are also there. Boeing, the big aviation company, is moving in as well. Um, so some very significant developments in terms of shifts in key players in relation to 3D printing. As retail 3D printing has declined a little bit, there's a much more heavy emphasis upon industrial 3D printing. Um, and in terms of our statistics in relation to countries, the United States is still a very dominant country in relation to 3D printing patent families. Uh, but China is racing up in terms of the statistics Japan and Germany and Korea, also very significant. Australia is towards the lower end of that table at the moment. So perhaps we've had some significant developments, but we will need to do more to uh, really compete effectively against some of those other players. So that's my grand overview of what's happening in terms of the universe of 3D printing patents. Let's have a look at one of the kind of opening conflicts that has broken out in relation to a really key area relating to metal 3D printing. Um, and I want to kind of talk about this clash between desktop metal and mark forged. Look at the patent litigation and then some of the supplementary trade secrets litigation and the trial and the settlement. And this work has been partly inspired uh, by some of our previous events. We've had a lot of engagement with the a motor vehicle industry and it's very kind of significant both in our work here in Australia and doing some empirical work in Canada that metal 3D printing would have a very significant impact upon the car industry. And from there we've had this really incredible dispute uh, this year between these two emerging specialist companies focusing on metal 3D printing. Desktop Metal um, who's the, I guess, the antagonist in this particular case, the one who brought the lawsuit in particular to begin with, has had these laudatory mentions in the MIT Technology Review that 3D, uh, this particular 3D printer could finally change manufacturing and give designers and manufacturers a practical and affordable way to print metal parts. Uh, they have... Uh, 
had a very significant profile. Uh, Rick Fulop, the Chief Executive Officer, has been very vocal in terms of the potential of his technology. Car companies like Ford have invested heavily in the company as well. And as a sign of its rising significance, you know, the former head of General Electric has now joined the board of Desktop Metal. Their competitor, their rival, is Mark Forged. And Mark Forged, another Boston company, um, engaged in designing, printing, centering, uh, making parts, um, is operating in a very similar field, led by Greg Mark. Um, hence the name Mark Borch. So we kind of have a classic patent race, and in my work over the past couple of decades, I've always kind of been particularly interested in some of these patent races. And I think this one is quite revealing in its own way. Uh, so the competitive rivalry between these two companies this year uh, turned into a, a larger conflagration when Desktop Metal sued Mark Forge for patent infringement in relation to two patents, um, as well as in relation to trade secret misappropriation, breach of contract and unfair trade practice. Uh, to give you a sense of the patents, one patent related to fabricating multi-part assemblies and the other patent related to fabricating an interface layer for removable support. And in their complaint, uh, they alleged that as Desktop Metal begins shipping its studio system, Mark Forge is seeking to compete directly with Desktop Metal by offering its Metal X 3D print system. Based upon recent disclosures, um, Mark Forged seeks to compete using Desktop Metal's patented technology protected by the patents in suit. Somewhat indignantly, um, Mark Forged uh, then had a number of different arguments. They tried to allege that the patents lacked validity. They had been anticipated. They were obvious. They were indefinite. Uh, there were further arguments about patent infringement. So Mark Forge argued that its conduct did not amount to patent infringement, either the direct infringement that Professor Norgard was talking about or the indirect um, infringement. Also, they raised larger kind of questions about inequitable conduct, patent misuse, and unclean hands um, by their rival. This matter went to a patent jury trial. Uh, so in the United States, they still have juries trying to resolve complex scientific and technical disputes over subject matter such as 3D printing. And it's sometimes very hard to work out how the jury responded to the evidence that was presented to them and the larger arguments that were made about quite technical questions in relation to patent law. So in relation to the first key patent, um, the jury had the question, you know, answer yes or no in relation to this, the following questions in relation to these claims. So they both had to make decisions in relation to validity and infringement. Essentially, the jury found that the patent was valid. It hadn't been anticipated. It wasn't obvious. It wasn't indefinite. But they found that there was no direct infringement and there was no indirect infringement. So patent is valid, but is not infringed. Likewise, with the second um, patent, they had to answer yes or no uh, across a range of different patent claims. Uh, but they said that the patent had not been anticipated, it was not obvious, it was not indefinite, but again they found that the patent had not been infringed, either directly or indirectly. Um, and moreover, logically, following from that conclusion, the jury ruled that there had not been willful infringement, and they said that uh, a grand total of zero dollars should be awarded in terms of damages. Uh, so really significant uh, 3D printing dispute over patents related to metal 3D printing. Uh, Greg Mark was quite happy by the result and was gratified that the jury found we do not infringe um, our late, uh, 
and confirm that Metal X, our latest extension of Mark Forge printing platform, is based on our own proprietary Mark Forge technology. Desktop Metal, for their part, uh, were pleased that their patents were valid and they kind of said that they had further actions on foot in relation to trade secrets and perhaps they might revisit their patent questions on appeal upon further consideration. Uh, but they reiterated in terms of their rhetoric that they were very committed uh, to remaining a leader in relation to the metal 3D printing sector. So, as is often the case, patent law was supplemented by trade secrets protection and this secondary action then became quite important. There's been a huge uh, radical series of shifts happening in relation to confidential information of late, an expansion of civil remedies in a range of different jurisdictions, introduction of criminal penalties and procedures as well. Um, and that has certainly been the case in the United States. We've had some really mega litigation taking place over trade secrets uh, with Waymo winning in a settlement over Uber in a big trade secrets battle. Uh, but the US State Department has bring uh, lots of criminal actions in relation to theft of trade secrets. Uh, so this case is a kind of an instance of that expansion of trade secrets law. And picking up on Dr. Papalato's talk, I think there's a real tension between open licensing approaches in relation to 3D printing and a lockdown secretive approach in relation to 3D printing. And you can really see that in this case. So in terms of this dispute, Desktop Metal said that they had economically valuable trade secrets. They were unique, they were revolutionary, and they were highly valuable. And that an intern um, who was the brother of an employee of the rival company had worked at their firm and had taken confidential information with him back to Mark Forge. So there was an allegation that an intern was responsible for taking the trade secrets in direct violation of his obligations. Mark Forge said lots of the information that was being claimed by Desktop Metal wasn't protected by confidential information. A lot of the information that was confidential was on Google Drives that were available to a number of employees. There was no vector of trade secrets from desktop metal to mark forged, uh, but there was also uh, a denial that the intern had conveyed the trade secrets from one company to the other. Uh, so kind of quite interesting in terms of the series of denials. Um, in response, mark forged also made a number of different counterclaims against desktop metal. So they went on the offensive, and really attacked in a very similar way their rivals. And they said, desktop metal has the temerity to sue Mark Forge, even though it is the product of the unscrupulous and deceptive conduct of Rick Fulop and his long-term um, friend and business partner. So Fulop was at one point on the board of Mark Forge. So uh, the allegation here from Mark Forge is that desktop has infringed trade secrets, breached fiduciary duties, engaged in unfair business methods, that there was a breach of contract, a breach of covenant of good faith and fair dealing, as well as tortious interference, civil conspiracy, unjust enrichment. Uh, so Desktop Metal for its part denied all those allegations. So the matter finally came to a head. There was a trial. Uh, there was an airing of some of those complaints that this is a case about disloyalty and betrayal and both parties were engaging in various different pejorative claims about the other. Um, in the end, uh, the parties decided to end the trial prematurely uh, and come to a confidential settlement. And Desktop Metal and Mark Fulch announced that they had resolved all outstanding litigation between the two companies, and they acknowledged that neither company nor the individuals named in the litigation misappropriated any trade secret or confidential information belonging to the other. So it's hard to know what actually happened in terms of the confidential settlement, even less information than, say, the settlement between Waymo and Uber. 
Some have speculated that perhaps there was a licensing agreement between the two parties, as has happened in relation to past disputes over 3D printing. But I guess just to wrap up, I think in terms of my kind of conclusion, I think this is a really important early precedent in relation to um, 3D printing and patent law. Um, it also shows the increasing importance of trade secrets, uh, but it also highlights how important metal 3D printing is. And in some of my field work, um, I've looked at companies like Renishaw, who have been busy expanding into the 3D printing market and thinking about applications in a range of different areas. Um, and in Australia, I visited Titomic, which have been using um, CSIRO's patented technology uh, to develop a wide range of metal 3D printed products with their mega 3D printer. Uh, so lots of different possible applications. And it's interesting as well that even NASA has become quite obsessed about some of the possible applications of 3D printing, particularly in aviation, and have held innovation challenges to design 3D printers that could possibly work on Mars and develop buildings of one kind or another. But I'll leave it there.